Home is a place where I can be part of my community. It means a place of personal expression. Definitely it's not four walls. It's just me, my kids, and then the comfort. To have a place to bring family, um, to bring friends, to be somewhere that you can be proud. It's fundamental to our health. It's fundamental to our well-being. You know that no matter what happened to the world, you have a home to come back to. What makes a home, what makes a community, and what makes it yours? And what happens when all that is threatened? The re issue here is not bulldozing neighborhoods and fear-mongering. We're in the middle of a housing crisis. People are completely stressed out. It is pretty, pretty terrible. Crisis is the appropriate label for it. Metro Vancouver's is one of the worst in the world, and its effect is everywhere, from the politics. I can't continue to see my kids leave. I can't continue to see the bleeding going on, the hemorrhaging. To the legal. There's an actual economic incentive for landlords to evict tenants, unfortunately. And to the personal. You wake up every morning and you realize, as soon as your eyes open, I don't have a home. The impact on people with disabilities is especially severe. Even my peers were having trouble finding housing and they weren't disabled. I felt trapped. You, you know there's an injustice being done, but you don't know how to go about fighting that. There's a general feeling of helplessness. What is at stake is the future of Vancouver and, and the people and who gets to live here. I'm Grant Hardy, and this is No Vacancy, Vancouver's Housing Crisis. Where are you looking? You are looking at TV? Hi, my name is Ria Aurora, and I've been living in Burnaby for over 18 years. I'm a single mom with two teenage children, and my daughter, she's a special need, wheelchair-bound, and she has multiple health issues. And she was declared palliative a couple of years ago and pretty much getting nursing support every day so I can go to work and support the family. Ria and I spoke in their three-bedroom apartment on the second floor of a duplex house. For both Ria and her daughter Jessica, it's a home that's becoming increasingly difficult to live in. My daughter, she's growing and now transferring her from one room to another is another challenge. And we have so many lifting devices and wheelchair and a comfy chair. And then taking her into the washroom and her bedroom is kind of challenging itself because this house is not wheelchair accessible, but we made it somehow work for us. But now the way she's growing, um, everything is uh, getting more challenging. And in future, she is actually due for so many surgeries and um, for her scoliosis and her foot surgery. So we have to be extra careful not to bump around the walls or the door. So definitely we need something more accessible for her. One of the biggest frustrations is simply coming and going. Funding was provided for an outdoor porch lift, but as it ages, its reliability is a huge concern. Like we have to cancel so many appointments and that's affecting her schooling as well. She used to go every day, but not like depending on if the lift is broken. And a couple of times we had to call 911 to break the lift open and bring her out because she was stuck in there. So there is no emergency exit if we need to. There's no emergency exit for us. With rents skyrocketing and subsidized spaces in poor supply, Rhea is desperate to improve the quality of life for her family. I know she's never going to stand up. She's non-verbal, wheelchair-bound, but I'm trying to keep her as comfortable as, like, for the rest of her life, for as long as she's here. In Richmond, BC, blind martial arts instructor and renter Johnny Tai lives right on the border of change. When I first moved here, it uh, used to be just an entire block of old rundown houses. It, I used to joke that it's like living in a slum. We are on this very interesting uh, street where one end, one side of the street is all brand new, beautiful looking apartment condos. And then you get to this side, it's all fenced off, demolished property or abandoned property just waiting to be torn down. 
I met Johnny at the back entrance of his garden level two bedroom apartment, part of an aging duplex which has seen better days. It's a shame because it's a really big yard, the backyard is very nice space, but I can't, I don't ever use any of it because it's so cluttered. There's the chairs and furniture and uh, uh, old motorcycle. And even after living here for five years, I still tend to get uh, tripped off or stumble over things sometimes if I am not really paying attention. <laughs> Johnny showed me some other areas of neglect, starting with his front door. Ooh. So as you can tell, door badly need repair. Mm -hmm. I've been doing this and this is not too bad now, but in the summertime, you can't even lock it. In the summertime, it's, uh, the frame sags so much that it just doesn't shut properly. Wow. Yeah. One thing that a lot of my friends mentioned to me is, your ceiling look like they're going to cave in, and you can just tell it's like a very visible sag. You, you almost expect the upstairs neighbor to come crashing through the floor. <laughs> Definitely makes one nervous. Yeah. Sometimes I'm kind of glad I can't see them. Johnny and the other tenants complain, but expectations are low. They know what's coming. All they have to do is look down the road. My landlord himself has told us that uh, whenever he decides to develop the property, uh, we have to go. So there's no guarantee how long we have. It can be another day, it can be another month, it can be another year you're only one step away from being homeless. And I thought that's so sad, but that's true. Across the Burrard Inlet in North Vancouver, Heather McLaughlin tries to make herself at home after losing her residence when a fire gutted the building. Heather's rare skin disease and severe arthritis greatly affected her mobility. Her subsidized, accessible unit at a low-income senior's residence made for a perfect home. My suite was right across the street from the beach. I had everything I needed in there. It was the most comfortable suite. The rent was a third of my income. I was, you know, meeting with the community. My passion has always been with animals. So that's how I met most of the people in the community walking dogs and helping training. I thought I was there for life. And then this huge fire happened and I was completely homeless with nowhere to go. Lacking nearby family, Heather turned to the community for support and housing. I um, reached out to the community and offered free pet sitting for a roof over my head. They've been comforting me and and all the people in the community have done so much to help me. You know, helping me with storage, helping me with moving from restoration companies, helping me with insurance companies, and everything they can do, they've helped. But I'm stuck. I reached out to, you know, seniors helplines, disability help resources, Basically what they're saying is there's nothing out there. You wake up every morning and you realize as soon as your eyes open, I don't have a home. You know? How does, how does that feel? Awful. You know, but you think, oh, well, I've got a home today. You know, I've got another one next week. And it keeps you going. Housing insecurity is no stranger to renter Rolf Kemp. Living in South Surrey, BC, Rolf's small one-bedroom backyard house is perfect for him to indulge in his biggest passion, music. The place is chock, chock full of instruments, like guitars and keyboards and speakers and books and CDs and what have you, cables and stands and amplifiers. It's not just the music. Rolf's mobility is affected by the polio he had as a toddler and the rheumatoid arthritis he has now in his senior years. His current ground level suite meets his accessible needs, which makes losing it all the more painful. The house is being sold because the landlord has already, uh, already bought another house. It's going on the market and uh, the, 
have to, uh, I'm going to have to move. Well, you, you feel abandoned and you feel forced to do something you don't want to do, which nobody likes. And you, it just feels unjust. This is the third time this has happened to me in, in, the, in the last 15 years. Think of, think of it, it's through no fault of your own. Somebody says, you can't live here anymore. And you like it. And, and that, that's all there is to it. Rolf is under no illusions. He knows what will happen when the property sells. The evidence is all around him. Well, can you hear the, the, the house? Can you hear the hammers? <laughs> <laughs> this, is the, this is the house being built next door now. Three more houses have been built like that along, the, along this block uh, in the last two years. So this house is going down. This, this house is, is, being, is being trashed after I leave. But searching the rental listings is proving challenging. I've got to stop doing it in the morning because it's depressing as hell. It, I mean, at, at first, I, I, I wondered, why, what, why do I start to weep after about a half an hour of doing this? But the best I've found so far is, is a tar paper shack in Hope, which is, nice. you know, it's just, it's just poetic. It, you know, I would never go as far as Hope. I, I don't even want to live as far out of town as I do now. And, you know, I started drinking too much. I was lonesome all the time. Uh, and uh, I, I don't want to be that isolated anymore. We'll return to no vacancy after this short break. You're watching No Vacancy, Vancouver's Housing Crisis. Good morning, I'm Stephen Quinn, live from Studio 700 at the CBC Broadcast Centre in Vancouver, and you're listening to City Votes 2018. As the 2018 Vancouver mayoral candidates debated, there's no hotter topic than housing. But the problem that I've always had with your plan is you're that it talks about supply without talking about affordability That's or what totally Vancouver... That's totally false. Shauna, Shauna, please. No, please really. Don't. Housing in Metro Vancouver is on everyone's lips, and understandably so. The average monthly cost of a one-bedroom rental is $2,000. The price of a home is over a million, and the average apartment is going for over $800,000. With a median family income of under $60,000, Vancouver finds itself in an affordability crisis like few others around the world. Um, you know, I was appalled with the high housing prices we had, you know, so many years ago, and it's become incredibly much worse. Currently an MLA in BC's provincial legislature, as mayor, Sam Sullivan championed a policy of eco-density. The idea was to attack runaway prices by increasing supply through densification. We have a, a lot of demand for city living, and uh, we need to provide the supply of housing. You know, the, the way typically our system of government creates more supply is to sprawl, you know. So we are in Vancouver limited. We've got mountains to the north. We've got uh, ocean to the west. We've got uh, U.S. border in the south. And uh, we've got the agricultural land reserve toward the east. So it's very difficult, and uh, we're in a little bit of a crunch, and the, the result is high house prices. But as Sam soon found out, creating housing density wasn't going to be easy. People don't like change, and so when you're building more housing in people's neighborhoods, uh, they naturally oppose. That happens pretty well everywhere. As a power chair user himself, Sam argues that densification, particularly high rises, are key to more accessible housing. Mid rise building, that's the, the fad du jour. And uh, really, those kinds of buildings, especially when there's stairs going into those, uh, certainly row houses, that's typical for them to have stairs. And also for the mid-rises, they usually only have one elevator. And that is not accessibility. So uh, the worst 
performing uh, building financially is the mid-rise. It's only when you get to the high-rise building that they start to deliver more uh, profits. According to Sam, higher profits for developers means there's room for the city to require accommodations such as multiple elevators and to have percentages of new units set aside for accessible and affordable housing. But renter Johnny Tai isn't sure that enough affordable housing is being built and has noticed a distinct preference for higher-end real estate. There's a lot of big shopping centers, there's a lot of golf courses, there's a lot of apartment complexes, million-dollar houses being built. I think it wouldn't hurt anybody any if they um, just ask themselves, can we put some of these projects toward building more housing for the disabled, more housing for people who actually need them, and more housing that can be affordable for people who actually need them. For candidates in the 2018 election, there was no avoiding the heat or the debates. Our Vancouver housing dividend will make sure a low-income family in the city of Vancouver will get $500 a month in a rent subsidy. I see towers when I read your plan. Former Vancouver mayoral candidate Shauna Sylvester says that housing was central to every conversation on the campaign trail. So if I'm talking to seniors, it's a real issue because they can't find the supportive housing that they need. If I'm talking to people on the downtown east side, there is nowhere for them to go. But Shauna believes that the city can take steps to address the crisis. First step we take is that we look at our city land and our assets and we say, okay, how can we take that city land and leverage it? And then we can work with the community housing sector. It's a sector that knows how to build supportive housing. It's a sector that knows how to build affordable rental, and it's a sector that knows how to build cooperatives. So we give them the land and they build the housing that is appropriate for the communities that need it. Um, it we also have the opportunity to advocate at the federal and provincial level for more resources for the city of Vancouver. So that's another role that the city has to play. We can speed up permitting. We can really incentivize affordable purpose-built rental by speeding up the permitting and actually ensuring that they're not going through um, expensive long delays. Kennedy Stewart, who eventually won Vancouver's mayoral race, says that he noticed talk of housing even before launching his campaign for mayor. I noticed, uh, you know, I'd fly back and forth to Ottawa every, uh, every week as a member of parliament. And when I'm in Ottawa, nobody talks about housing, you know, if you're on a bus or something. But if you're on a, a bus or SkyTrain here, as soon as you get off the plane, you start to hear the housing conversation. People have been uh, rent evicted or their rents have gone up or somebody's left the city because they can't afford to live here. So it really is, uh, it really is taking all the fun out of the city. And I'd much rather talk about music or books or or movies or something, but, but really uh, housing seems to dominate our conversation in a very negative way. According to Kennedy, Vancouver is living through the effects of governments abandoning housing in the 1990s. Today, demand for new units is high and existing housing stock from the 70s and 80s is aging and in some cases disappearing. So we have to get back into building affordable housing. And the city can do a huge part in that. That we can uh, build on uh, city-owned land. We can build. Uh, we can build affordable rental housing that's uh, run by uh, nonprofits, and that really takes the, all the speculation. It takes all the profiteering out of uh, those homes. And, and that's how we're going to make these buildings uh, that are not just cookie-cutter boxes, you know, towers in the sky, but they'll be specifically designed uh, in mind for for uh, people in the community that have different needs. But Kennedy knows that accepting change can be difficult for communities. There has to be some incentive for neighborhoods. What do they get out of this extra density in their neighborhoods? Uh, and if you spell out that they get new coffee shops and parks and grocery stores and those types of things, often that goes a long way to, uh, to, to make people feel more comfortable with this. Uh, for, for more kind of controversial housing, so if you have uh, social housing or temporary modular housing, so if you can get over those initial, the initial shock of change uh, and, and have reasonable discussions with folks, uh, I'm sure that we can make this work in the city.
One neighborhood undergoing change is Strathcona on Vancouver's east side. It's an area known for its diverse population. Resident and architect Bruce Hayden generally welcomes change, but has some concerns. For example, one of the things that's changed is a lot of the houses, the single family houses, used to be legally or not chopped up into smaller apartments. And some people have now bought them and reduced the number of people um, living there. So that's actually an interesting and negative phenomena in my experience, because this was one of the places where, like I say, a, new, a newcomer to the city could meet with someone who liked living in a funky neighborhood that wasn't too sanitized. And that's changed for sure. Part of it is that cities are both incredibly dynamic places and, and places that are very, very resistant to change. Uh, so for example, one of the reasons that we have a housing crisis in Vancouver is that a very high percentage of, that, of the land in Vancouver is still zoned for single family residential. And single family resident, residential can't hold a lot of people in terms of the number of bodies that can live in a, in, in a block, it's pretty low. So, and it's also seen in my view as often a kind of morally superior house form. Like when politicians talk about single family neighborhoods, they often talk about protecting the single family neighborhoods. I more worry about someone who arrives in the city as I did, which with no money and um, needing to find an affordable place to live to start a life and a career here. And those are the people that I think really need support. So for me, I want a city that has space for artists, that has space for people who work in the service industry. And I want that not just because it's good for them, because it's good for me as well. Stay tuned. No Vacancy will be right back. Welcome back to No Vacancy, Vancouver's Housing Crisis. In real estate, location is everything, and Vancouver's certainly blessed with it. Surrounded by mountains, ocean, farmland, and the U.S. border, Vancouver's become a highly desirable location and destination. But that blessing does come at a high cost, one that's only rising, so much so that in 2018, Business Insider rated Vancouver as the third most expensive to live worldwide and the most in Canada. I love Vancouver, but living in Vancouver is like a pressure. Jocelyn Maffin is the Resource Centre Manager at Spinal Cord Injury BC. The place you have to live, even if you own it, is really not your own. At some point, someone's going to want that or knock your building down or, you know, or you're going to lose your job and not be able to make your payments. As a wheelchair user herself, Jocelyn knows firsthand the struggle to finding accessible housing in Vancouver. I was raised with this sense of um, confidence that if I tried my hardest and if I used my brain and and was very um, strategic about things that I would always be able to take care of my needs. Um, and I had I had applied to everything that could be applied to. The reality of seeing that the actual available housing for me, someone with a graduate degree, was a small percentage of the overall housing available to the general public and even my peers were having trouble finding housing and they weren't disabled. I felt trapped. Working for Spinal Cord Injury BC, Jocelyn is well aware of the challenges people with disabilities face in Vancouver's housing market. Dealing with uh, oftentimes a lower income um, and oftentimes higher costs related to medical equipment or or even a restricted number of hours that they can work. It depends on the person. Um, but when you're dealing with that alongside an affordability crisis, it means that the already scarce number of opportunities for housing for you are even smaller. And when you think about all of those overlapping needs that a person with a disability has to coordinate, you have to get everything perfectly in line, the transportation, um, the, the geography, the access to your basic needs, 
sometimes you're getting to and from public transit so you can get to you know, your medical appointments, for example. Um, getting all those things to align perfectly is almost impossible. And so people with disabilities often have to have to compromise, often in really unsafe ways, because that's all that's available to them. Renter and blind martial arts instructor Johnny Tai has found himself making this exact compromise. I found an ideal place. It's, it's very well tended to. The landlords are good people. But the bus stop was like three miles away. <laughs> <laughs> and I just couldn't take that place because if I took that place, there's no way for me to go to work. There's no way for me to get anywhere where I live now. There's a lot of uh, convenience nearby, a lot of store, but I can't get to them because the streets here are notoriously dangerous to cross, even for sighted folk. The street here, mostly they have no sidewalk and in the summertime, it's not too bad, but when it starts to rain, everything turns to muck. It's slippery, it's dangerous, and it gets even worse in the snow. For Surrey resident and renter Glenn Loft, being away from his support network in Vancouver has real consequences. After suffering spinal cord injuries in a car accident, Glenn found aid for his mental health struggles in his former East Side community. I don't have my support network near me is what the problem is. Or my, my, my friends, my church and my community. I'm out here in the middle of Surrey, Surrey Central when I should be in Vancouver doing my work. I was happy that I became a better person. I was happy that I got involved and volunteered and made a difference in the disability community and have my church at the Holy Rosary Cathedral embrace me with the, with the archdiocese and sing in the choir. And, and if I was having a bad day, I could go up to Ravensong Mental Health and sit down and talk to somebody right away, you know, or, or go out to see my doctor. I had, I had an outlet in a place where I could have all that. And, and I'm not screaming and crying, but I'm, I'm very saddened to say that once I stepped out of Vancouver, all that went away. Musician and renter Rolf Kemp has also felt the impact of being further out of Vancouver. As a member of the Vancouver Adapted Music Society, Rolf enjoyed being close to other musicians and played with them often. For me, I don't try to replace the world with music. It's just that I need it to live in the world. I need it to, to, to to process it. If I don't do that, it gets stuck and I go crazy. For Rhea Aurora, being close to her daughter Jessica's school and support services is important, especially considering Jessica's deteriorating condition. But finding another affordable market rental in Burnaby seems impossible. I moved here 10 years ago and at that time we were like uh, giving thousand dollars a month but at that time I could afford but now it just grows every year by 10 percent and then on single income like a it's 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 too much we'll return to no vacancy after this quick break You're watching No Vacancy, Vancouver's Housing Crisis. As all of you are aware up on, there, on stage, more than 50% of the people who live in the city are renters. Uh, many live in precarious situations tied uh, to the whim of a landlord and the provincial rules that allow annual rent increases. If elected, what measures will you implement at the city level to bring some relief to renters. The topic of housing was central during the 2018 Vancouver elections, but in a city where buying a home is increasingly out of reach, more people are choosing to rent. With skyrocketing costs and a vacancy rate below 1%, landlords hold nearly all the cards, and that leaves tenants vulnerable. We have definitely seen a, a drastic increase in the amount of evictions that are coming through our door and um, folks who are, are needing assistance with that. Danielle Sabelli is a lawyer at the Community Legal Assistance Society. 
Landlords do have the ability under the Residential Tenancy Act to evict a tenant if they need to undertake repairs or renovations. What run evictions are, are essentially landlords wanting to evict tenants for the purposes of being able to bring in a new tenant and charge an exponential amount of rent. There's an actual economic incentive for landlords to evict tenants, unfortunately, and some landlords take full advantage of that. So they will just try to get the tenant out in a way that's um, no fault of the tenant so that they can undertake these repairs or renovations. Oftentimes they may not actually be doing that um, or the renovations or repairs are very minor or cosmetic, but again, the purpose there is to get a tenant out so they're not restricted by the rent controls that they would otherwise be beholden to under the Residential Tenancy Act. And of course, that also leads to gentrification and entire communities where affordable housing um, was prevalent now becoming eroded to make way for more expensive rentals or developments as well. For blind martial arts instructor and renter Johnny Tai, the signs of gentrification are at his doorstep. A wave of new condos and luxury cars are replacing the old housing and used vehicles of former residents. And it's pretty clear that Johnny's landlord is just biding his time. The neglect shows. I have not seen my landlord for about three years. <laughs> um, Every year around November, his brother come around and collect the entire year's worth of rent checks from everybody and then disappear. Uh, when, when we need anything repaired, we would call the landlord's brother, uh, who I guess is the property manager for him. But the brother quite often is not in town, so you need something done. You're looking at at least uh, three days, at the, uh, but quite often it's weeks and weeks of waiting, phoning him, complaining before anything gets done. In Vancouver's seller's market, Johnny has few other options but to hold on to what he has. He knows he's not alone in experiencing housing insecurity and he worries about the impact on vulnerable groups. Eventually we're going to see a lot more disabled people being forced onto the street because they simply, with the government check, with whatever work they can find, simply can't afford anything. I was once homeless myself when I was a teenager. I can tell you from first hand, it's, uh, it's bad when you are sighted. It's going, it would be worse if you are not. For Heather McLaughlin, the stress of being without a home weighs heavily. Since losing her accessible apartment to a fire, Heather's been running on adrenaline and trading pet care for shelter. But the exhaustion is real, and she doesn't know how long she can keep it up. Well, I've lost 20 pounds. Um, my arthritis is, of course, with the weather getting colder, it's, it's tough. And then dealing with strong dogs, strong animals, it's taken a real physical toll on me and my eating, I haven't been able to eat well. What am I gonna do? <laughs> like, who's going to help me? I can't be in a shelter with my health. According to lawyer Danielle Sabelli, the hardest part of her job is seeing vulnerable tenants who have exhausted all their options and are now facing eviction. People believe in where they live. People believe in, in, in Canada. People believe in BC and they believe that they're not just going to be tossed aside or ignored or having to um, live such a lower standard of life that there's nothing there to protect them. Our government has promised to increase tenant security and tenant protection, and we are waiting to see that. Vancouver's new mayor, Kennedy Stewart, made a step in that direction with the promise of a new position at City Hall, one specifically for renters. What I've said is we have to hire a renter's advocate at the city of Vancouver. Uh, lots of other cities have them around the world, and if you think about how City Hall's been traditionally structured, it's all for the homeowner. 
it's all for people getting permits for building or, or construction. It's, uh, there's a big real estate department. The planning is really all set up for homeowners. But now that half the city is renters, we have to now invest city resources in making sure that the renters are, are looked after in the city. So uh, a renter's advocate that I'm proposing would uh, be really in your corner as a renter to make sure that, you're, that the landlords are all abiding by the laws, uh, especially with folks that have accessibility issues or say uh, English as a, a, an additional language or seniors that, uh, that are uh, often on fixed incomes. Uh, this is super stressful and sometimes landlords or building owners can be quite tricky when they're trying to get you to leave your apartment and we've seen this a number of times and so this renter's advocate is one of the first positions that i put in place and then the public uh, there are other good organizations around the city will help you but this one would indicate to renters and to landlords that the city has the back of renters Protection against discrimination is another area of concern for people with disabilities, and it can show up in subtle and not so subtle ways. We've seen a lot of um, nefarious and illegal practices from landlords who want to gather a lot of private information from tenants about their, you know, a lot of personal details, which they shouldn't be asking. And so we do see a lot of people who offer up information that they're not entirely comfortable with offering up, nor do they need to offer up, but do so because they want to secure housing. Being blind, Johnny says that the search for a new rental is filled with unfair challenges. When landlords hear that I cook, they get nervous. They think I'm going to burn down the place. When landlords hear about I teach martial art, they think I'm going to hurt myself and bleed all over their place. Um, there's a lot of those uh, stigmas you have to overcome. The only way for me to actually finally get a place was I always bring a huge stack of reference letters with me. Character references, fa uh, reference from previous landlords, everything. And before we even met, I said, look, I know you are going to have questions regarding my blindness. Here are all the references. If you read all of them, if you check them out, then you'll, hopefully you'll feel better about it. It's a kind of struggle that happened to so many disabled people. You, you know there's an injustice being done, but you don't know how to go about fighting it. There's a general feeling of helplessness. Stay tuned, no vacancy, we'll be right back. Welcome back to No Vacancy, Vancouver's Housing Crisis. An overheated housing market like Metro Vancouver's sends shock waves beyond its borders, impacting coastal island communities and towns heading into BC's interior. We're at the crossroads of the Trans-Canada Highway, the Coquihalla Highway, the Fraser River, CP and CN all cross in hope. Roughly 150 kilometers east of Vancouver, Hope, BC, is at the eastern edge of the Fraser Valley. Crystal Sador is the housing manager for Yale First Nation, which is centered in Hope. There's no place for our homeless people to go. There are a lot of young people who are couch surfing right now in Hope and area, and there's just nothing available. With more members wanting to live on reserve, Yale First Nation is also feeling the housing crunch. We have built 10 new units just in 2017. They are passive units, highly energy efficient and highly affordable, but we still have many people who are waiting for homes. Since the reserve's territory is fixed, the new modular homes offer density, affordability, quality and environmental efficiency like never before. Modular historically meant trailers. Nowadays, modular simply means built-in factory and shipped to site upon completion. The passive modular homes feature extra thick insulated walls and specially designed windows and doors that maintain the temperature inside. New technologies help reduce energy costs by roughly 93%, making these homes affordable even for those on social assistance. For Yale First Nation, the modular housing projects also mean welcoming more members home. Well, we've returned almost 30 tenants to reserve. 
some who've never lived on reserve before. We want our, our elders to be able to age at home in dignity and surrounded by family and community supports. In order to provide temporary homes for those most in need, the City of Vancouver has also adopted modular housing. It's an idea that architect Bruce Hayden fully supports. Contemporary modular housing recognize that we are in a very, very serious situation, that um, we had excess land and there were ways to affordably create good places for people to live. I was walking by one of the ones that has recently been installed quite close to here, and uh, they've done a really good job with the outdoor space because one of the things about temporary modular housing is units are very small. And I'm fine with small units, but you need good outdoor space, you need good shared space, because those are the spaces which community um, is generated in. And if you don't design these things in a way that generates community, then you're just creating warehouses. So, uh, but I think it's a great solution, actually. BC Housing is the provincial crown agency that manages some of these modular projects for the city. Brenda Proskin is BC Housing Regional Director of Operations. So there's lots of reasons for people who uh, become um, street or sheltered homeless. It can range from everything to um, simply not being able to afford housing, and in this province that's not uh, all that unique, to individuals who will have some uh, mental or physical disability that causes them uh, to not be able to maybe work any longer and to supplement um, their income to afford housing. Um, some people who are experiencing substance abuse and addiction issues and uh, who um, need to um, live indoors. Um, and then there are um, other individuals who by circumstance, they're fleeing um, some form of violence, a circumstance or situation. In all those instances, they have unique needs. And so what we do is we work um, very closely with the individuals and with nonprofit housing providers to go through a thorough and a thoughtful assessment of those needs and then match how the nonprofit provider can actually provide services to those individuals. Services that help them to be able to come indoors, make them feel welcome, create a home, and to be able to stay living in that home. Eric Oisverd is a resident at one of the city's temporary modular projects. Due to multiple sclerosis, Eric uses a walker to aid his mobility. His MS made it difficult to find work, and Eric spent some time living on the streets. It's hard to live on the street because you're tired all the time and there's no way you could sleep during the day like, or at night. And like, because you can't sleep anytime whenever you want to or feel to or whenever you're tired. <laughs> Not even on a chair, like you can't even sit down and fall asleep because they come and wake you up all the time. And I wouldn't be able to walk at all, pretty much. I'd be crawling on the ground trying to walk to get to places. And it's scary sometimes when you don't know if anybody's going to come at you and, and rob you or whatever. You got, always got to watch it. Keep an eye on your stuff. Eric's unit accommodates his walker easily. Its wide doorways, bathroom, and kitchen are fully accessible. But although he's happy with his home, Eric knows that his time here is temporary. According to Brenda, the goal is for residents to transition to permanent housing. Some of the other things that the housing providers do is work with all of the individuals to talk about their next stage in life. And what is it that they want to do how do they want to get healthy? And eventually talking about moving them on to permanent housing. Housing that may not have as many supports, so they may still need some money to help them and get some subsidy on cheaper rents, which that's what BC Housing provides in the form of social housing. So it's housing without the high needs. For Eric, securing his accessible unit has been a life-changing first step. I feel better anyways, a lot of stress off my mind. I haven't been sick since I got here, like sick and, and I haven't really got any sore stomachs or nothing like that. It's just, I've been feeling a lot better than, uh, than being out there and out in the street, you know, worrying about things all the time. According to Brenda, 
the province has provided new streams of funding to assist other groups with affordability as well. So there is a community housing fund, which is to be able to provide affordable housing for families and seniors. So mi mixed income and families in particular are struggling as well because they often need two, three, maybe even four bedrooms uh, for their um, family to, to fit into. Families like that of renter Ria Aurora can't wait for an increase in supply of accessible units. They've been on the BC Housing wait list for many years. Uh, with BC Housing, with the criteria, we provided them that we need uh, a wheelchair uh, accessible parking and um, wheelchair accessible, like, like the whole unit and uh, three bedrooms. So based on what I gave them, there's only five um, buildings that have those kind of apartments. But the, again, there is no, nothing is available at the moment. Dealing with wait lists has left Heather McLaughlin frustrated as well. After losing her apartment to a fire, Heather has tried navigating through multiple lists, which is complicated by the fact that many properties are managed independently. They will never ever contact us, which everybody I think was under the understanding that if you were with BC Housing on their priority list, they would contact you. But no, the buildings have to contact BC Housing. It's only if they've got you in their radar that you've applied, then they check with BC Housing to make sure you're on the list. It's day in, day out, trying to find places, trying to find phone numbers, trying to find addresses, it's trying to get help, you know, to get to places. It's, oh, it's just really, really hard. Stay tuned. No Vacancy will be right back. Welcome back to No Vacancy, Vancouver's housing crisis. There's a lot of big shopping centers. There's a lot of golf courses. There's a lot of apartment complexes, million dollar houses being built. Uh, people love that idea that it's not them that's causing the trouble. It's not our own policies. It's some foreigners that are causing all our problems. There is this uncomfortable conversation we have about housing where some people want to blame particular groups, and that is very dangerous. Wealthy investors, foreign buyers, speculators, these are often portrayed as the villains behind Metro Vancouver's housing crisis. But former Vancouver mayor, Sam Sullivan, says that the statistics don't back that up. Right now, foreigners are now 1% of all purchases are foreigners. It used to be 5%, it's usually been 5 or 10% throughout the whole history of the city. You know, when the first foreign buyer tax came in, uh, the whole system was shocked for a little bit and prices sort of went down for a few months and then they just went soaring back up. So um, personally, I think it's a myth. Uh, a lot of economists uh, think it's a myth. Uh, now more and more with all this new data we're getting in, it's pretty clear that it is a myth. Vancouver's current mayor, Kennedy Stewart, has a similar view on these popular scapegoats. That's why I don't like, like to talk about foreign investors buying housing, because in a lot of cases it's not true. It's, uh, it's speculators that are local, or at least in Canada, that are, that are buying up a lot of these properties for profit and, and treating them as commodities. Uh, and that's why uh, we have to deal with facts rather than anecdotes. And the fact is, in order to deal with housing, the city must increase supply. One organization that works with developers to increase the supply of accessible housing is the Vancouver Resource Society, or VRS. What we do is that we get involved at the onset. Um, we're after, often a component of a project. Um, the role that we play is, is to provide affordable housing. Architect Brad Tone is development manager with VRS. The first thing that we do is we sit down with them and we, uh, we show them our guidelines and we demystify the process. We explain to them that um, it doesn't have to cost more. It just takes some care and attention and uh, that's what we're here to help them with. We're here to 
give them the resources that they need, um, make it easy for their architects, make it easy for the development team. I think we've reached a point now where there's a synergy uh, between the municipalities and the planning and groups like our organization and developers. Renter Mark Stockbrocks lives in a VRS wheelchair accessible unit. Well, I moved to Vancouver because uh, to be eligible for, I have a specialized implant, a baclofen pump for my spinal cord, and I needed to live within X amount of distance from the clinic itself. Mark's previous apartments weren't accessible and presented barriers daily. My first unit in Yelltown, uh, it had a ramp up to the building, but there was no way I could get in by myself because there was no automatic push button. Uh, so I was reliant on everybody and anybody in distance to help open the door. While I was trapped, I mean, like my apartment, I couldn't get out for like two years on my own because it had a hydraulic closing latch. So when I opened the door, it just closed right away. And that was really tough to get out. And the same thing going in. So it wasn't ideal. Um, but it got me by until I found this unit that I'm in right now. Mark's unit includes an automatic front door, wider hallways, a wheel-in shower, and fully accessible kitchen and appliances. Yeah, I love it. Um, it's home. It's a lucky situation for me. Rhea Aurora hopes that her luck changes soon. An accessible home like Mark's would make all the difference for herself and her daughter. To that end, Rhea's family is on BC Housing's priority list for an accessible unit in their area. Like, I really hope they have like a bigger, wider doors and um, more space and um, uh, keeping that in mind about the different equipment that Des Jessica uses on a daily basis. Rhea's biggest concern is the quality of life for her family and her daughter, Jessica. I see her as a cheerleader. <laughs> On her good days, like, she gets really loud and she's happy, she's very social, she loves music. That's her, she's still there, fighter. Heather McLaughlin hopes her luck changes as well and finds a home from the many wait lists she's on and wonders if her experience with animals could help her. There are a lot of pets out there that sit home 10, 12 hour days, people go to work, maybe, you know, to subsidize their basement suite. I could work looking out, you know, walking their pets or feeding their pets and pay a little less rent. Although losing her home to a fire has been tough, the support she's received has been heartwarming. The way the community came together is absolutely unbelievable. I had no idea there was that many good people out there. Rolf Kemp can feel the clock ticking. His landlords will sell the property shortly, and Rolf hopes he can find a new place that will let him make music for his sanity and for a source of income. Uh, worst case scenario, I'll find a one bedroom apartment somewhere, maybe in a, on the corner of a building. As far as sound goes, I'd, I'd just try and find the most isolated spot. Or I'd, I, I could get just a really cheap, uh, single just a bachelor pad and try to try to find a cheap rehearsal space shared maybe which is yeah. i mean y you do what you have to do johnny ty knows that his aging rental suites days are numbered and where he lands next might mean a big adjustment i may have to pick up and move entirely to a different city to somewhere uh, cheaper, maybe, uh, to a smaller town. If I uproot and move to a new place, I have to deal with learning where I am, learning my environment all over again, uh, dealing with new people, getting to know new people, convince new people that I can work, I'm trying to reestablish my work, I'm trying to prove myself all over again to a new crowd. That would be devastating. That, that, that definitely would be devastating. Cities like Vancouver are called the engines of the economy, and local businesses rely on growth to survive and thrive. So change is inevitable. 
and yet we often fight it. My own neighborhood is undergoing massive change itself, and it's tough. Long-time businesses and favorite local hangouts are closing to make way for taller, denser, and more expensive properties, and the constant construction is a headache, making getting around challenging. However, if all this means that there were more homes for people with diverse incomes and abilities, it would make accepting the transition easier. Clearly, developers do have a role here, but governments and nonprofits like VRS are also an important part of the solution. Because it's the diversity that has made Vancouver what it is today, and it desperately needs to hold on to it as it moves forward. The stakes are high. Vancouver's future depends on it. Host Grant Hardy, producer Amit Tandon, videographer and editor Sergio Vera Barahona, additional camera Cynthia Valenzuela, integrated described video specialist M. Williams, audio post Mark Phoenix, senior producer Michelle Dudas, VP programming and production John Melville, President and CEO David Arrington. Copyright Accessible Media Inc. 2019.